Hello. Can you hear me? Thank you and welcome to our idea taster lecture. Uh, I will start in a couple of minutes because uh, we are waiting for a few more participants. Thank you. I will start in two minutes. Okay, is it all right? Yeah, bias, that's fine. We can, I think we can start uh, now or very, very soon. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, thank you everyone. I hope you can hear me and thanks for joining us today. Um, I am Baez Ahmed, I'm currently working as a lecturer in the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction at UCL. Um, today, uh, my taster lecture is about methods matter. I will introduce a very pop popular method called participatory rural appraisal or PRA and how can we apply it in practice and some of the limitations and advantages out of many. So to be, before I start, I want to introduce myself. I'm from Bangladesh. Basically, I'm an urban planner and GS specialist in practice. Uh, I did my bachelor in urban planning then I got an MSc in Geospatial Technologies. It's all about geographic information system, remote sensing and computer programming, how we apply them uh, for producing some interesting maps and diagrams, followed by I did my PhD in disaster risk reduction from UCL IADR. Then after a couple of years of postdoc, I joined as a lecturer here in 2019. And thank you for participating. And I hope you will enjoy today's lecture. So before we start the lecture, I also want to talk about a little bit about, um, yeah, I want to introduce uh, slightly about the UCL IADR. IADR stands for Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. We are purely a multidisciplinary department. Yes, uh, we are now a department, no more an institute, although we haven't changed the name yet. Uh, but we have our head of the department is Professor Peter Sammons. We have around 10 permanent staff members. We have 30 PhD students. We run four MSc programs here at IADR. One is uh, more focused on the science one, risk and disaster science. It's more focused on physical science. The other one, resilience one, is a blending of physical science and social science. 
we also have centers for gender and disaster, uh, digital public health run by Patty, and all the staff members like the 10 and 11. We have expertise in different field from climate change adaptation, physical modeling, to our social science, gender and disaster, and ge geospatial science. And next we have, we are going to start or introduce our new BSc in Global Humanitarian Studies from next year in September, 2021. So we are also uh, getting lots of interest from uh, the A-level students as well. And so as part of the idea taster lecture, today my topic is methods matter and PRA, how we can apply participatory tools in disaster risk reduction. At IRDR, we introduce uh, different things I already mentioned from uh, hard physical science to our soft social science. In physical science, we introduce how to produce or prepare multi-hazard maps, flooding, earthquakes, landslides, and many other things. And then we move forward to how to develop landslide or different other flooding or different multi-hazard early warning systems. Also, we have a very strong component of social science and we try to assess community vulnerability and our other team members, they focus on that. We have GIS and remote sensing courses uh, in our MSc programs, followed by we introduce NVivo, how to analyze social science or micro narratives or similar data. Also, we introduce other methods like quantitative method, R programming language, how to analyze questionnaires. So we actually at IRDR, we introduce a wide range of different methods and techniques here. Out of them, I will introduce today, uh, I will talk quickly about participatory rural appraisal methods, the PRA1. Uh, this is just for half an hour, uh, taster lecture, of course, not the full lecture that takes four hours almost on any specific topic, but you will have a glimpse of what is happening at IRDR and probably through other lectures, the upcoming one, the previous one that are already, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them you will have a sense of what do we teach at IADIA uh, through our taster lectures, I hope. And uh, shortly, uh, Yasmin will play. I have recorded a video presentation. It's in total 30 minutes, part one, 16 minutes, and part two, probably again, 16 minutes. In between, we'll give a pause for after 15 minutes presentation. If you have any question or queries or anything, if you want to ask, please feel free to type in the Q&A chat box. Okay, mm, any question or anything from our audience? If not, uh, we will run the first video that is 16 minutes long. Okay, Yasmin, uh, let's go for it, thank you. Welcome to my presentation on Methods Matter, Participatory Tools in Disaster Risk Reduction. I am Bayez Ahmed, a lecturer in the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction at UCL. Today I am going to explain why it is important to involve local people in decision making and how we can achieve it. As a background, we professionals working in academia, consultancies, NGOs, government ministries, for UN organizations, or any humanitarian sectors. We work in the context of natural hazard induced disasters, war or conflict, pandemic, and climate change adaptation. We try to understand their social vulnerabilities, their resilience characteristics, and sometimes we recommend policy guidelines for their better recovery in a sustainable way. We can apply a number of different methods, but today I will introduce 
how can we apply participatory rural appraisal or PRA methods for producing a meaningful results and outcomes. A quick overview on what is disaster risk. This is a product of hazard, exposure and vulnerability where hazard and exposure are the A quick overview A quick overview on disaster risk it is the product of hazard exposure and vulnerability where hazard and exposure are physical dimensions and vulnerability represents human dimension that can be subcategorized into social economic ecological or environmental institutional and cultural our today's focus would be vulnerability I will give two examples from flooding in Bangladesh, a country in South Asia. This is a flood inundation map of Bangladesh dated 4th of August 2020. And you can see almost one third of the country is now under flood water. If you have a laptop, you can produce this kind of flood inundation map within just few hours and even without going to the field or without any interaction with the local people. This is another flood and river erosion map of Bangladesh. It has three categories, low, moderate and severe and showing different types of flooding includes flush flooding, river flooding and tidal surge. But on the ground, the reality can be different. This is a photo from the northern Bangladesh. And the structures here are shelters, actually, for the people fleeing river erosion. But now you can see the shelters are under threat of river erosion. It can happen when you ignore the local communities and you don't involve them in decision making. This is a photo from the southern coast of Bangladesh. Actually it is a brand new cyclone shelter that was handed over to the local authority in June 2020. But just after a month the shelter was surrounded by river water. It happened because of three kilometer of river erosion. Now I will show a short video. You can see the impact of river flooding and river erosion. This is a three-story primary school from northern Bangladesh. And now you will see the cyclone shelter from the previous slide. It is almost under river water. Just after a few days, it was completely gone. But the problem is the local people is now blaming the higher authorities because they did not consult them before selecting the site for the cyclone shelter. That's why I always say yes it is good to have a hazard map but you must place people at the center and you should learn from them who experience daily the consequences of natural hazards. So we lost here three things. One is the cyclone shelter itself. Second, of most half million US dollar. And third, it impacted almost 500 local primary school going children. So that's a massive loss and we should be careful when making a decision. We must involve local communities, local people, scientists, both physically to avoid this kind of miscommunication and disasters, you must have to visit the local communities, talk to them and try to collect primary data. To do that, we need to apply social science methods, namely quantitative and qualitative. If we combine them, we call it mixed methods. I will start with quantitative. Uh, having a 
structured questionnaire is very popular in quantitative social science like this here you can see we have questions and some predefined answers and our field investigators and translators go to the local communities and talk to the household members here is another photo from our field work our field investigator talking to the household head from the questionnaire quantitative surveys we can produce percentages or frequencies even we can combine two or more variables and produce interesting graphs we can also run regression statistics taking multiple variables however uh, this is one way to reach the local people at least far better than just only relying on physical hazards map but it has some limitations for example sometimes it lacks precision and accuracy because of the sample size uh, sometimes we rely on less number of surveys it also hinders the connection between the work we are conducting and the reality and of course it fails to distinguish between the people and the natural world to address the limitations in quantitative work we have qualitative methods for example one-to-one -one in depth interview here this is one-to-one -one interview again but we don't have a structured questionnaire or format just free open discussions some other methods namely storytelling and collecting micro narratives focus group discussions are very popular here you invite 10 or 12 people from the communities so it's not one-to-one -one discussion but you invite some of them and arrange discussions participatory rural appraisal or pra i'm going to explain it today here you can even invite more people like 30 or 40 and you group them and conduct some survey other methods include observation and case study here i'm conducting a focus group discussion in a rural coastal area in bangladesh we invited some local men and women and the fgd lasted for around 90 minutes we had open and frank discussions and we tried to record it we took notes and we discussed about their ongoing problems and how to resolve them this is a good way of collecting primary data so PRA methods I'm going to introduce it here uh, again just to mention it helps local people to participate more in a more democratic way and they can be involved in planning and acting the method is not new it was uh, introduced in late 70s then become popular in late 1980s it is also known as participatory rapid appraisal now i will explain how we can apply pra methods in reality taking a case study from turtuk in ladakh india the workshop was conducted in july 2017 this is the workshop venue you can see it is surrounded by high mountains the climate is also extreme here Turtuk is the northernmost village in India located 3000 meter above sea level it is predominantly a Muslim village with a population of around 3400 it was part of Pakistan but during the Bangladesh Liberation War in 1971 India took control of Turtuk the red dot here in the north you can see the location of Turtuk it is located just near the line of control uh, heavily contested area all the three nuclear rich countries China India and Pakistan 
claim some part of Ladakh so you can see and understand conflict and war is very regular phenomenon here also because of its location uh, surrounded by high mountains and rivers people here regularly face flash flooding and landslides in this photo there was an Indian army camp that was completely destroyed by flash flooding in 2015 apart from the 1971 war the village was also heavily bombarded during the 1999 Kargil war next we invited the local people to participate in the workshop they include local school teachers, healthcare officials, religious and political leaders, army officers, project team members, and general local people, both men and women. In total, 40 adults participated and we divided them into four groups, local men, local women, political leaders, and administrative officials. We wanted to know the similarities and dissimilarities in their perception of risk. That's why we divided them into four different groups. Next, we applied three tools, namely timeline, hazard mapping, and dream mapping. In timeline, we requested them to identify any major events they can recall from the past, like any natural disaster events, conflict or war, or any mega interventions with in hazard mapping we request the members to draw their community and identify different services facilities or infrastructure they have within their village like roads different houses school healthcare center and also surrounding nature like rivers hills and mountains and then we request them to identify the areas they think are vulnerable to different hazards in dream mapping this is about how they want to see their community in the next 20 or 30 years and how the problems they have already mentioned in the hazard map can be resolved so we request them to redraw the map and propose something or some interventions to overcome the problems so this video was captured by me here you can see how the community people or the participants are drawing PRM maps. This is the local men's group and you can see active participation from the local people. They really enjoyed it. Here is another group, you can see how they are drawing the PRA maps, discussing among themselves. We have provided the color pencils and the drawing paper. It gives more freedom to them. They can discuss among themselves. It's far better than one-to-one -one in-depth interview or conducting structured questionnaire serving. That's my understanding. Next, we invited them to present their PRA maps and diagrams. Here are some photos. This is the men's only group and we took detailed notes. We also recorded their presentations and later we translated them. We also scanned the PRA maps in the left, you can see. And later we digitized them using professional graphics software. We did it for publication and reporting purposes. Now it is time to analyze the PRA maps and diagrams. For example, here we produced a hazard matrix. It shows the impact of different hazards on the local community. For example, the local people mentioned river flooding is responsible for human casualties and damages to their houses and agricultural field. Interestingly, they also mentioned Tourism is changing their cultural pattern. Okay, thank you for listening and watching part one where
I quickly try to introduce uh, why participatory methods are very important because um, with due respect in our field, and that is disaster risk reduction, physical scientists really dominate and having multi-hazard maps, warning systems, these are very common. And you have um, different types of hazard maps. For here, I introduced flooding and river erosion, uh, taking a case study from Bangladesh at the beginning. And what happened having all those hazard maps in reality is different. You can understand uh, the sufferings of the local people uh, you know, doesn't comply with the hazard mass produced by the physical scientists or uh, by the decision makers, you know, who really do not uh, visit the communities, but they take the decisions from their headquarters or even the physical scientists mostly. I mean, apart from the field validation that is a minor part of hazard mapping, they try to produce this kind of hazard maps from their official desktop. Uh, so there is, I always feel uh, we miss the communication between scientists or decision makers and the local people. That is very important to listen from them and apply uh, their recommendations. For that, I believe, and we have been applying the PRA methods, it's been almost over 10 years, and we found a real success in applying it. And in the middle of the presentation, we in, I introduced, I just also gave some quick comparison between quantitative and qualitative methods. In quantitative, it's all about numbers producing graphs, but in qualitative or PRM methods specifically that I'm discussing today. Here you can see how people are spontaneously taking uh, or participating in the uh, mapping and in other exercise, and they are sharing their ideas and recommendations. And in the next presentation, in part two, I will elaborate further what we can do by applying this kind of PRA methods. Here I have only introduced three. Um, uh, there are around 30 or 40 different tools, but I have only talked about um, timeline diagram, participatory hazard mapping, and participatory dream mapping. But in the part two, I will explain more how we can apply, you know, uh, how we can uh, develop a model. We call it community consultation model where we involve uh, physical and social scientists, the local people, and of course the decision makers. This is very important because ultimately they take the decision, but we wanted to make sure the voices from the local people are heard. So yes, if you have any particular question, probably not now, if you don't have it, uh, probably after watching part two, uh, then you will have the proper sense of the entire presentation and we can discuss few things, the limitations and advantages of PRA and we can compare it with other methods. Okay, so yes, Min can play video part two. Thank you. We also had a physical science team and they conducted extensive geological survey in the surrounding area. Later they produced a standard multi-hazard map of Turtuk. So basically we had two types of map. One is the standard physical hazard map and the other one produced by the community people through PRA. Let me explain one PRA hazard map. It was drawn by the women's group. They managed to identify many elements within their community. For example, the Shiok River, the Turtuk Lungpa stream, the surrounding mountains and hills, play fields, agricultural land. I can see the bridge there, police station, the school itself, and many other facilities. They also identified high, medium, and low risk areas. They also justified the answer from their presentation. There is another PRA map. This is a hazard map. 
And from their presentations, they mentioned they still live in highly hazard prone areas. They have lackings in electricity and internet. Also no surgical unit. There is less awareness of earthquake risk. And they have other problems related to family planning and communication with other nearby cities. This is a dream map drawn by the women's group. Here they propose some new interventions to overcome the different problems and limitations that they are currently facing and they have drawn in the hazard map. Uh, for example here they have proposed new park, picnic spot, more guest house for the tourists, more planned building structures, another army camp, a bus station, connecting roads to Manu and other nearby cities. So this is a new, I mean this is how they want to see their community in the upcoming years or decades. This is another dream map and from their presentation on dream map we could identify like they have strong community bonding they have knowledge from their past disaster events they have strong support from the indian army and their strength is about having the medical center and training and education and different other activities we also published a number of papers from our workshop and from the project that was academic impact but we did not stop here in july 2019 after two years we went to tuk again and conducted a community feedback workshop it was important to go back to them to build trust and in the workshop we presented all our findings recommendations we also printed those PR maps in large papers and distributed among them Next, we developed a community action agenda in consultation with the local people. They mentioned to create a community DRR group to develop a disaster risk awareness program. There should be good practice building codes. They wanted early warning system and evacuation planning and drills. This community feedback is really very important. You must go back to them, share your results and findings. It is important to build relationship with them so that they don't think you are there just to publish your work and you forget them. But no, we didn't want to do it. We wanted to really apply the findings and recommendations in reality and we wanted to reach the higher level of authority. That's why we proposed a community consultation model. It has five steps. Number one, you conduct a participatory workshop where you involve the local people and local stakeholders. Next, you produce the standard geophysical hazard map. In step three, you should compare all those maps and diagrams, their presentations, analyze them, try to publish journal articles, reports, and policy brief. Step four is about going back to the community and to co-develop a community action agenda. This is about what to do next and how to reach the higher level of authority. Step five, we call it community advocacy here uh, with all our recommendations and findings from local level, we try to reach the upper level authorities are top decision makers. What we did, we organized few meetings with the lay district administration and also our team members extensively uh, helped them to edit and revise their local disaster management plan. In the proposed community consultation model, we have involved almost all possible stakeholders, local people, expert and scientists, both physical and social, stakeholders and decision makers from local level to the national or district level. So if you can apply this kind of consultation model and you follow the five steps, you might end up listening to the voices from the people. Here is another participatory workshop we conducted in 2019 
in Banda Aceh in Indonesia. It was about we wanted to understand how they recovered from the 2004 tsunami and how they are now coping with You can also apply PRA tools in extremely vulnerable context. For example, here we worked in the Rohingya refugee camp in Cox's Bazar. We applied a school children's drawing activity. We wanted to know their living standard in Bangladesh and in Myanmar. But please note, you need high risk ethical approval to conduct this kind of work because you are involving children, refugees, and other vulnerable communities. We had support from the local school, uh, their guardians, and also we had mental health support. This is a very sensitive topic and you should handle it accordingly. Now I will quickly differentiate between quantitative and qualitative method. In quantitative, let's say we are going to conduct a structured questionnaire survey and in qualitative we are applying a PRA method. Quantitative is about numbers, of course, we produce statistics and graphs and numbers and qualitative about words. In quantitative, the researcher gets priority because it's their idea and they barely discuss with the local people about their questionnaire. But in qualitative, it's completely all about the local people. We just listen to them without and we don't interfere. Here in quantitative, you can test a theory, but from qualitative, you can develop a new theory. That's very interesting. One is static. Of course, you just have a structured questionnaire and you go and talk to just one household member. It feels very artificial. Whereas in qualitative, it's more dynamic. People spontaneously participate, they express themselves, they draw the maps, they present, and we just record. And very little intervention comes from our side. Definitely one is structured, another is completely unstructured. In quantitative, this is we get reliable data because we conduct statistical significance tests. In qualitative, it's more subjective. It's their opinions. We take notes, we record them, but this is deep data. One quantitative you can apply in macro scale like the entire population survey, population census, but for very micro details you can apply PRA or qualitative methods. For example, if you want to go and visit one particular village or local area, you can apply them there. Yes, I already mentioned qualitative is it feels more natural, whereas quantitative, it feels artificial. Now I will explain the steps that one should follow to apply any PRA method. First, please set your project aims and objectives in any particular context. I mean, you should know what you want to achieve. Next, please select the appropriate method. To do that, you should be familiar with other available methods in your field. Don't select randomly the PRA method. Get institutional ethics approval, whether high or low risk. You should also conduct risk assessment and get the health insurance. Take local level fieldwork permissions. This is very important and your local partner should do it. Invite the local participants carefully. They should represent the community as a whole. Please also keep in regular contact with them. Otherwise, you might end up with less number of participants on the day of your workshop. Find a nice and cozy place. It can be a large room or conference hall. Uh, before that, please discuss with your local partner and the local people. There might be some social and cultural barriers. You should be uh, careful about it. Uh, you should provide other basic facilities. I mean, the venue should have toilets or changing rooms. 
and you can provide stationaries like the pen pencils papers uh, voice recorder should be there camera and there should be enough number of table and chairs you must recruit and train local translators you should discuss with them before the workshop they might not be familiar with your PRA method so please train them on the day of the workshop there should be provisions for tea coffee lunch and if people traveling from long distances you should cover their travel cost To begin with, you should introduce the team, yourself, your work, what would be the possible benefit, if not, what you are not harming them, you should explain it. Take proper consent and permissions for recording and taking notes from the local people or the participants. During the workshop or peer activity, you should take detailed notes, photographs and videos with their permission, of course. After that, try to scan the PRM maps and diagrams, take photos of them and store them in safe places. Digitize all the maps diagrams professionally using softwares and share with your team members. Don't lose it in any circumstances. Later try to analyze, write and publish. It can be blogs, articles, reports, policy brief. Don't forget to conduct another feedback workshop with the same community. And try to implement your findings in reality. That should be considered as an impact. For do that you can apply our community consultation model. Please remember, any PR method is a trial and error process. It is also very expensive as well. You can see we traveled from London to Ladakh and then later in Turtuk. We had a team of 10, 10 members. It involves lots of travel, accommodation and cost for food. So it is a very expensive method to apply. And please remember, you might not get success in your first few attempts. That's why always work with experienced people and uh, relevant expert. To conclude, we should remember hazard maps and early warning systems are at the heart of DRR science and we should never ever ignore them. A number of people and scientific community are working daily and consistently to improve or produce much better early warnings. But it is also time to go and talk to the local people, reach them and conduct community vulnerability assessment. For that we can apply PRA and other social science methods. Also remember, no method is superior or flawless, whatever you are applying quantitative or qualitative PRA methods or anything else, GIS or remote sensing techniques, field observation. We should not undermine another method. It all depends on how do you apply it in reality. It also depends on the funding, time, skills and other resources whether you have those or not. It also depends on your project aim and objectives. Finally, these are the three bullet points from the UK Met Office. They have multi-billion, multi-million dollar supercomputers where they consistently produce early warnings for different hazards, flooding, cyclone, drought, many other things. But now they are really keen to understand how the decision making process works and how to reach the community more effectively. Otherwise, you know, you might have a very good or accurate multi-hazard map or early warning systems, but if the local people or the people on the ground, you don't, they don't understand your warning messages, then it might end up with no use. I always say methods matter, whatever method you want to apply, quantitative, qualitative or mixed, it all depends on your project aim and objectives 
and you have also promised something to your funder your employee or to your reporting boss in terms of deliverables and impact to achieve all of them please do not forget to select the right method and apply it appropriately here are some of the references I have used for my presentation today and thank you so much for listening if you have any question you can email me okay thank you everyone for listening to my presentations um, so what I did today just within half an hour I tried to introduce one popular method called participatory rural appraisal or PRA and I also explained how we applied the method in reality and it's not only about applying the method because uh, in academia what we mostly do we go somewhere in some interesting places try to analyze the hazard and social vulnerability and we go and apply as part of our project and we come back publish and we forget uh, so that's a never ending loop and we really wanted to stop there and move forward go beyond how we can apply you know the findings from our field work i mean the we have from four different groups we had around uh, 12 different types of PRA maps in large papers. Uh, what we do with those maps, what we do with those recommendations from the local people, I mean, mostly uh, their voices are not heard to the higher authority, you know, the decisions are made thousands of kilometers away from the local village. So, yes, we always stop in step three. You remember step one is conducting the workshop itself, step two the physical scientists, they produce their maps. And in step three, you combine physical science and social science, and you try to publish journal articles, write blogs or reports for your organization. It might be an NGO or research institute. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, step four should be followed. Uh, that really helps and that brings the real world impact and uh, that we call the community feedback workshop so when all the articles were published the reports were written policy briefs are there what we did uh, yes it took us two years but we went to visit them the same community almost uh, many of them were common in both workshops we again explained what we did what are our findings and then revisited and recalculated all the recommendations. And then we call it a community action agenda that we produced. Uh, that is again, uh, refined recommendations from the communities, from our work and their understanding. And step five is very important and forget it. The community, I mean, advocacy. Uh, what we did, we went to the lay district commissioner and they were luckily at the same time they were trying to uh, produce a hazard map uh, sorry uh, a risk sensitive land use map for the entire Ladakh district that also involves the Tutuk village and we brought all our recommendations and our team members professor David Alexander and others Jessica Field I was slightly involved and also professor Peter Simmons uh, they sent us their MS Word file, the entire uh, disaster district, uh, district disaster master plan. And we edited that document, we incorporated our comments. That's a real world impact. And we call the entire package, the all five steps, uh, community consultation model that should be followed based on our experience to apply or to get real world impact. I believe that answers my first question from some, someone anonymous who asked me, uh, please feel free to uh, write down your questions in the Q&A and I have nine minutes. I will try to answer all of them. Uh, first question is about, yes, I work for a humanitarian sector. I applied DreamMap. That's a great idea, but uh, 
the person is confused about how our expectation managed and how can we achieve it. Uh, it sorry, many things can be achievable, but often funding and governance is a challenge, yes. And how we can achieve the expectations from the local people, that's why I said, yes, if you follow step four and five uh, and go beyond the traditional step one, two, three, and probably applying the community consultation model might be, uh, you, you might find it useful. Okay, I go to the next question. Let me read it first, then I will read it. Okay, so the next question is about the last slide in conclusion, where from the UK Met Office, they mentioned understanding the decision-making process. Mm. And Daniela wants me to, uh, mm, yeah, explain it more. Yes, about decision-making process, that is very important. Mm. In some countries, you all know, our field is uh, vast and it is context-based in different countries in the UK, probably the decision-making works in a different way. And the case studies brought by me today from Bangladesh and India. Here, it is more top-down. Uh, I mean, yeah, the Ministry of Disaster Management, they first take the decision based on some, you know, expert meetings within their uh, capital city where the head office is located and then they try to impose those decisions within the local community. Uh, to break that down, the top-down approach, uh, we propose the community consultation model. Here you can see the step one is the PRA workshop that starts from the local people. And then you give priority to the physical scientists, then report writing, again, community people, and step five goes to the top decision maker. So. Uh, it is, we are not saying it is bottom up. Uh, this is another method. Um, I also believe bottom up doesn't work in reality as well. So it's a mix blending of both top down and bottom up our community consultation model. Okay, where is the next question? So the next question is about some scientists have criticized PRAs as obscuring the pre-existing power structures and its influence on local vulnerability creation. Others argue that conducting by supporting agencies, based on your experience, what are the practical ways to ensure the local diverse groups and opinions are represented while conducting PRS? Yes, um, again, it is the same question I also tried to highlight here in my work. I, I never said, um, just randomly pick up the PRA method and apply it in your context. You first have to, if you remember the steps I have mentioned, the 16 different steps you should follow. The first one says you should know your project aim and objectives, and then you should analyze, I mean, what I need to do. I mean, is PRA a good fit for my project aim and objectives, and do I really need to apply it? or do I need to apply another method? Um, here you can see the, my presentation is not all about applying PRA method. Uh, only step one is PRA method, but step two, we are also listening to the physical scientists. Uh, they have produced their own map and we compared them. And also it's not about the local people only. Step three and step four, the community consult, I mean, community feedback workshop, where we also in involve local stakeholders as well. And step five, we involved um, higher level authorities for taking proper decision making. So it's a combination of um, all possible stakeholders and from local people to the higher level authority. And we are, we are not ignoring anyone. Of course, here there is a reduced impact of quantitative method, but I don't know about your particular context where sometimes you also apply GS and remote sensing tools and techniques. In some cases, we only apply structured questionnaire. It all depends on your project aim and how you apply the method 
any particular method where at IRDI, we not only talk about PRA, this is just a taste of lecture for half an hour. Uh, we also introduce many other methods ranging from multi-hazard mapping, early warning system development, GIS and emergency, that's very popular nowadays. And many other qualitative methods, I just introduced one Okay, uh, Nurul from Indonesia men asked me, what is the important point that we need to remember when we try to analyze the PRA result, like the participatory hazard map, so we can get the best result from this method. Most important from the PRA hazard map. So in a PRA hazard map, the community draw the map themselves without any intervention from any outsiders. Uh, they identify all the different elements within their community, different resources they have. And later at the end, uh, they identify with circles or rectangles. They say, we believe this part of the community is highly vulnerable to flash flooding. And then they explain why they think probably they experienced because they live there daily, isn't it? For years and years and decades. And we just go there for a week. So, and sometimes through our observation, we try to impose our decisions on them. That is not fair, even for the higher authorities, but the people who live there for decades after decades and probably for centuries, like in Turtuk, uh, listening to them is very important. And those kind of PRA hazard map is very useful because later we can compare that with our typical hazard map and see where are the similarities and dissimilarities. Okay, so the next question is from David, who asked me, did people tell you something about how they behave against disasters like flooding? Yes, uh, definitely you can download our article. And also we have produced some reports from the work. Um, here, because of time limitations, we could not explain all the PRA hazard maps. And they all presented their maps for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, long. And we recorded uh, using a voice recorder. And yes, we analyzed all of them and they talked a lot about uh, all their hazard maps, different problems they're facing, and they also propose different recommendations. Okay. Mm, I think I have answered all the questions. Thank you. Is there one question left from Daniela? I wonder if you have seen a change in the acceptance of peer methods in academia or if you have found that there are specific framings that can strategically serve young scholars just to use PRA methods in social science. No, definitely. I mean, PRA methods were very popular back in 80s, 90s, even 10, 15 years back. It was very popular, but suddenly something happened. People, yeah, after all those criticism and limitations probably are because of the introduction of new methods like programming techniques and many other methods, um, people started uh, using less frequently the PRA methods, but now again, it has revived and being very popular. It all depends on which context you want to apply the method. There is no straightforward answer. Uh, it, it, whether PRA is a correct method or not, it depends on the context. And I say there are 20, 30 different types of method in the DRR science. You just pick the one that is suitable for your project aim and objectives and apply it. Yes, thank you. That's all for me uh, today. Uh, I have another taster lecture at 5 p.m. UK time. And thank you so much for listening to me. If you have any further questions, you can email me and thank you.